Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and all of our digital theater goers out there tonight. Uh, I'd like to start by saying just how happy we are to have you all tune in. Uh, as Professor Charlebon noted, this is obviously not the setting that we imagined we would be staging a performance for you in, uh, but we're nevertheless hoping to continue the evening with another great performance to follow the King's Women. So we are the Lord Chamberlain's Women, and this evening we will be performing a scene from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night for you. Now, Shakespeare wrote this play in 1601, and it comes after a series of playful comedies interrogating gender and male-female relationships. So think of shows like Much Do About Nothing and A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, while Shakespeare returned to comedy later on in his career, uh, this is often looked at as his last great festive comedy. Uh, to articulate what that actually means, <laughs> what you need to know is that this play is built on the premise of misrule and the undermining of social uh, societal norms from gender to social class and beyond. So the play's namesake comes from a holiday dedicated to revelry, uh, the Christian celebration of the Feast of the Epiphany, otherwise known as Twelfth Night. So it takes place on January 6th, uh, the 12th day after Christmas, and this 12 day period in between the two holidays was really designated as a time for revelry, celebration, and merrymaking in a way that the rest of the year really uh, pushed away and pushed down upon. So English Elizabethans would have recognized this as a time of respite from the rigid hierarchical social order uh, that usually ruled their society. It was a period where boys were crowned bishops and where bouts of heavy drinking and celebratory song and dance were not only indulged in, but were actively expected. Uh, this transgressive time, however, was really only permissible by authorities because there was a prevailing belief that it was a necessary release from tensions that would be otherwise dangerously pent up and could threaten to lash out against the existing and understood social order at the time. Now, this spirit of subversion of social status and morality pervades the play's world of Illyria, uh, presented through cross-dressing heroines and through brazen servants who speak out against their masters. So it's important to know all of this because our scene, as we staged it, leans very heavily into disrupting these common early modern sociocultural structures. Now to situate you into the world that we'll be immersing you in for the next hour or so this evening, the play opens with Viola, a young woman who's been shipwrecked on the coast of Illyria. She believes that she's lost her identical twin brother, Sebastian, in this shipwreck. And so as a single woman alone in the world, she believes that her best way moving forward is to don the clothes of a man, assume the identity of Cesario, and immerse herself into the household of the uh, Duke of the land, Orsino. Now, Orsino is infatuated with the idea of love and sort of infatuated with the idea of, him of himself. <laughs> and he's long been uh, trying to court the Countess Olivia, uh, who herself has lost her brother and has sworn herself off from really society and any sort of courtship for the next seven years. So when this young, handsome man, Cesario, enters into the picture, Orsino sees it as the perfect opportunity to succeed with Olivia and employ Cesario as a would-be proxy suitor. Uh, unfortunately, things don't really quite pan out as he expects. Uh, well, Olivia falls in love with Cesario in their first meeting, Cesario, of course, being Viola. Viola herself fought, has fallen in love with Orsino at this time. And while all of this is going on, Orsino and Cesario have formed a very, very tight bond uh, between the two of themselves. So as you can imagine, hijinks and chaos ensue. Now I should note that this device of cross-dressing is an entirely unique to Shakespeare's, uh, to Twelfth Night or to Shakespeare as an individual. Uh, Shakespeare alone wrote three other plays before this involving cross-dressing uh, female characters dressing as men. And it really provides these female characters a voice and a power that they would otherwise be robbed of um, in, in female presenting clothing. Uh, so, sort of like what Twelfth Night was in the real world. Uh, although misrule rules in Illyria, it can't continue uh, without an end. And so ultimately by the play's final act, Viola's brother is discovered to be alive and thus Viola can shed her disguise as Cesario. Uh, and ultimately heteronormativity and normalcy is resumed as Olivia marries Sebastian and as Orsino declares that he will marry Viola. So as we're all aware, this medium wasn't exactly our intention for tonight. Prior to our change into the virtual stage, we had planned to perform this at the Blackfriars Theatre in London. Now, this theatre is closely associated to Shakespeare's company. They began using the theatre around 1608, and this is seven years after Twelfth Night was actually written. But we found that the stage and the play were, actually, were very compatible with each other, and here's a couple of reasons why. 
first, its indoor theater was a much smaller stage than that of its outdoor counterpart, The Globe which allows for a lot of intimacy on stage between actors as well as the actors and the audience. As you can see in this picture, there's stools on the side of the stage, which some lucky patrons could pay some lucky extra money um, to sit there and let themselves be seen by the audience and as well as the actors. The actors would interact with them and such throughout their performance. But most important to us, it allowed them to see little subtle nuances in their performance that other audience members might not be able to see. Before Shakespeare's company took over, the theater hosted performances by boys' companies. Boys' companies were just what they sound like. They were performances by young, youthful boys. They're extremely popular at this time, and they threatened a lot of adult troops, actually. So with this history of the Blackfriars having, hosting these boy um, companies, and the many themes in Twelfth Night, of boys playing women playing boys, we found that the, this was like a nice setting for them to pay homage to both of the histories of both the stage and the play. Another thing is that the Blackfriars is a private theater. The ticket prices were expensive and not the everyday man could go to see these shows. Audience were primarily made up of established wealth and those of social prestige such as gentry and wealthy merchants and they were all hopeful of climbing that social ladder. Now, Twelfth Night has a lot of, the has a lot of themes about um, social climbing in general. So they could have seen themselves as the many gentry that are represented in the play, and they also saw what they longed to be, like Duke Orsino. Furthermore, regarding the audience, the theater housed a mix of a mixed gender audience. And with all the plays on gender in Twelfth Night, we thought it crucial that we wanted to perform this in front of men as well as women. And lastly, our scene has music. So get excited for that. It's going to be fun. The architectural structure of the Blackfriars has really good acoustics and it lends itself extremely well to music. Um, and they also had a dedicated musical troupe for the Blackfriars Theater. All of these reasons combined, we did choose the Blackfriars Theater to theoretically have our performance staged in. Hi all. So in taking a deep dive into the tumultuous waters of Twelfth Night, our group decided to explore a few research questions in greater depth. Um, first, we wish to question the nature of melancholy, both as it relates to Orsino and um, Orsino's love-stricken idealization of the concept, and also how it relates to Festi's song that drives the scene that's about to take place. Um, secondly, we examined how the nobility of the time were expected to interact with their retainers and vice versa. And lastly, and though I'm somewhat biased, um, perhaps most importantly, we want to comprehend the context of gender as perceived in a Renaissance England and subsequently cross-dressing both on the stage and off. So to contextualize where we're going to essentially plop you in the plot, <laughs> uh, we're staging Act 2, Scene 4. So Viola, in the disguise of Cesario, has already fallen in love with Duke Orsino, who is, of course, ignorant both of her feelings and her identity as a true woman. Now, at this point, Viola has already been sent to court Olivia as Cesario uh, without success. So Viola is aware that Olivia is smitten with Cesario and subsequently cannot return the feelings of Orsino, but this really doesn't deter the Duke by any means. Uh, after requesting Olivia's jester, Festi, play a forlorn love song, he orders Cesario once more to go to Olivia on his account, uh, as Viola at the same time is attempting to dissuade him from this pursuit. So a large part of our scene concentrates on the discourse between Orsino and Viola about the strength of a man's love and the weakness of a woman's, and partially inspired by Festi's song, uh, quite a bit of the scene is also Viola's subtle hints about her true identity and her feelings for Orsino. So within the scope of the scene, I will be playing Festi. Festi is a jester employed at Olivia's household and was employed by her father before that. Uh, it's my job generally to entertain with jokes and with song, but you'll note that I'm not serving Olivia in the scene, I'm serving Orsino. Uh, and so it kind of positions Festi uh, somewhat uniquely among the canon of Shakespeare's other fools and clowns, and that he's this untethered force that can move between households and between places without real approach. 
Uh, he knows in the scene that Orsino is not his master, although he is a social superior, but it doesn't really stop him from freely using his wit to point out Orsino's follies. Now, often in these stagings since Twelfth Night's premiere in the 17th century, Festi has been portrayed as an omnipotent figure who comments on the foolishness of others, again, without reproach. So it makes him a kind of proxy between the in-text world uh, on the stage and the audience's world. I'm playing Curio. I'm an attendant of Orsino's. Um, he has been under Orsino's um, household before Cesario's arrival. Curio falls under the identity of a gentleman, which makes him a part of the social class gentry. Curio is al always and only present when Orsino is on stage. His constant company of Orsino means that he is quite, quite accustomed to Orsino's thoughts, antics, personality. But curiously, if Curio, the name doesn't sound familiar to you, don't be surprised because Curio doesn't make his presence known very often on the page. He doesn't have many lines in the entire play, but that gave us a big opportunity to have a little bit of interpretation with him. And I'm playing Viola. Um, sister of Sebastian and cross-dressed heroine of the play. Um, infatuated with Orsino, she is disguised as Cesario and forced to relay messages to the man, from the man she loves to Olivia, who in turn comes to love Cesario himself slash herself. In a kind of complicated love decahedron, which um, Casey already explained way better than I can. And I'm playing Orsino. Orsino is the highest ranking member of the cast and as such spends the majority of the play interacting with people of lower status than himself. This combined with the over the top interest in his own requ unrequited love can make him come off as a character that is rather full of himself. However, while we won't be disputing that reading, we will add that Orsino is a very well-read man whose interest in the melancholy naturally draws him to the two grieving women, Olivia and Viola. He is not only the ma only major character that does not ever mention any sort of family ties, but perhaps, um, and perhaps this reading of him uh, as a man without a family mo motivates his pursuit of Olivia and the immediacy of a strong bond with Viola slash Cesario. During our performance, there are specific choices that we've made that we would like to keep an eye out for. Please pay special attention to the subtle interactions between Viola and Cis Viola and Orsino, especially how they react to each other's opinions. Viola's presentation of herself and the way that she and that each character reacts to the music performed in front of them. We also ask that you note specific care specific costume choices. Now, before we be we begin, I ask that you please have your settings in gallery mode and uh, hide all non-video participants if you are not already. Uh, so that there are only four boxes uh, on the screen with our beautiful faces. Um, and due to the volume of the lines we have attempted to memorize, we may call Privy, which Abby will kindly feed the line to us. And now... We shall begin. Sorry, I'm trying to get my thing right. <laughs> Give me some music. Now, good morrow, friends. Now come, good Cesario. But that piece of song, that old and antic song we heard last night, we thought it did relieve my passion much, much more than the lively airs and recollected terms of these most brisk and giddy paced times. Come, but one verse. He, he's not here, so please your lordship, who should sing it. Who was it? Festy the jester, my lord, a fool that Lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He's about the house. Seek him out then, and play the tune the while. Come hither, boy. If ever thou shalt love, in the sweet pangs of it remember me, 
For I am as all lovers are in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. How doth thou like this tune? It gives very echo to the seat where love is throned. Thou dost speak masterly. <laughs> My life upon it, young though thou art, thine eye is stayed upon some favor that it loves, have they not, boy? A little, by your favor. What kind of woman is it? Uh, of your complexion. <laughs> she is not worthy, then. What years in faith? Um, about your years, my lord. <laughs> Though all then by heaven, let the woman then take an elder than herself. For she wears... To her husband, so sway she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more wavering, longing, sooner lost and worn than women's are. I think it will, my lord. Then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affection cannot stay to bed. For women are like roses, whose fair flower once display doth fall that very hour. And so they are. Alas, that they are so, to die even when to perfection grow. Oh, fellow, come, that song we heard last night. Mark it to Sario, tis old and plain, and the weavers and the knitters in the sun, and the free maids who weave their thread with bone did used to chant it. Tis silly soup, and marks the and dallies with the innocence of love like the old age. Are you ready, sir? I pretty sing. <clears throat> Come away, come away, death, and in sad cypress let me be laid. Fly away, fly away, red, I am slain by a fair cruel maid. A shroud of white stuck all with you, oh, prepare it. My part of death never won so true, did share it. Not a flower, not a flower sweet, on my black coffin let there be strong. Not a friend, not a friend, greet my poor corpse where my bones shall be thrown. A thousand, thousand sighs to say, lay me, oh, where sad true love never find my grave to be there. for thy pains. No, no pains, sir, for I take pleasure in singing, sir. I'll pay thy pleasure then. Well, <laughs> truly, sir, pleasure will be paid one time or another. Give me now leave to leave thee. Now the melancholy god protect thee, and the tailor make thy doublet of changeable tafta, for thy mind, sir, is a very opal. I'd have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere. For that's it that makes a good voyage of nothing. Farewell. Let all the rest give place. Pretty. Once more, Cesario. Once more, Cesario, get ye to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, 
prizes not quantity of dirty lands. The parts of fortune that has bestowed upon her, I hold as giddily as fortune, but tis the miracle and queen of gems that, <laughs> that nature pranks and attracts my soul. But if she cannot love you, sir? I cannot be so answered. Sooth, but you must say that there be some woman, as perhaps there be, who have for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her. You tell her so. Must she not be so answered? There is no woman's mind that can bear the beating of so heart a passion. No woman's heart that can that's so big to hold so much, they lack retention. Alas, though their love may be called appetite, <laughs> no motion of the liver but the palate. They suffer surfeit, coyment, and death, and revolt. <clears throat> but I am all as big as the sea and can digest as much Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. Ay, but I know. Hold what dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith they are as true as hard as we. My father had a daughter who loved a man, as would perhaps I, a woman, would love you. And what is her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love, but let concealment, like a worm in the bud, feed on her damask cheek. With green and yellow melancholy, she sat, like patience, on a monument, <sighs> smiling at grief. Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our, our shows are more than will for still we prove much in our words, but little in our love. But died her sister of your love, my boy. I am all the brothers, all the daughters of my father's house. And all the brothers too. Sir, shall I to this lady? Aye, that's the theme. Go to her in haste. Give her this jewel, say, my love can give no place, buy no dinay. Okay. <laughs> and so now we will be switching into our uh, post-performance analysis. <laughs> that is me. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Eli. All right. So I hope you all like the scene. Um, yeah. So, okay. Sorry. Just going to get my, my nerves calm down for just a second. Then I'll be right with you. Um, Eli, could you actually go back one slide? Now we went forward. We're still going forward. I apologize, people. All right, there we go. All right, great. Um, so the Renaissance view of sex and gender, which I'm going to be talking about here on the very first slide, of gender in the early modern world, um, it was incredibly complicated. Uh, topic of discussion. And in hindsight, that just becomes even more complicated. So the primary issue of contention was that there were two models, actually. Um, there were two prevailing theories, basically, at war with one another. There was the first, which was the one sex model, which was Galen Galenic and Hippocratic model, um, as opposed to the two sex model of the, oh, I can't pronounce it, the Aristotelian. Charlevoix is going to kill me after class because I mispronounced that. Um, model. So the one sex model believed that both men and women were both at the ba their basis the same. As you can see in the image um, right on the, I think it's on the left of me from your guys' screen, um, 
basically the what men and women's genitalia were seen as inversions of one another. According to Galenic theory, all people were to some degree hermaphrodilic. In contrast, the two-sex model contended that men and women were intrinsically different on a fundamental level, and that there could only ever be men and women, and never shall the twain meet. For these reasons, uh, children and eunuchs were seen as akin to women as they were viewed as underdeveloped men, um, being associated with coldness, moistness, as opposed to the metaphorical heat of men, um, with manliness being dependent on the ability to both produce sperm and this said heat. Um, interestingly, uh, one philosopher, I suppose you could call them, Duval at the time, um, declared uh, quite amazingly that the penis as the center of the man's heat was more important of an organ to the body than the heart, which moves us on to the next slide. So gender nonconformity in the early modern world. Um, in so a society that largely attempted to fashion strict gender differentiation via clothing, uh, just as it would with sumptuary laws in the case of nobility, as we'll go over soon, um, cross-dressing was itself inherently subversive. Um, intersex individuals, cross-dressers, homosexuals, and what we would call trans people nowadays, so of course they didn't call it that then, um, they were all largely distinguished or clumped together under the banner of hermaphrodite, which was not only um, associated with erasing the bounds between men and women, but also erasing the bounds between men and beasts, basically making monsters. Um, therefore, the changing styles of dress at the time, uh, wherein women began to appear, uh, wear more masculine clothing and men wore more ornate finery, um, were lambasted by both religious and secular authorities like. The contemporary pamphlets of Hickmuller and Hickveer emphasize this, uh, both translating to the mannish woman and womanish man, respectively. Uh, but nowhere was cross-dressing more commonplace than the theater, which will move us on to the next slide. So cross-dressing on the Renaissance stage. So due to prohibitations against women actors in the Renaissance England, all female roles of the time were played by boy actors. Uh, due to the wide, widespread sorry, malnutrition, uh, puberty began much later into life than it does today, and so these individuals could play these roles up widely into their mid-teens, usually. Of course, this practice was widely criticized as well. For one, as said before, the practice of theatricizing oneself as female was believed to elicit homosexual behaviors. Um, for another, many, especially religious figures, argued that cross-dressing was inherently immoral and compromised the moral fabric of a community. In fact, one of said per people, though they were not religious themselves, a religious figure of himself, to my knowledge, uh, as you can see on the screen here, was Gossen in his um, lambasting of the theater, basically. And yet, despite this, um, many of Shakespeare's so-called cross-dressing plays, such as Twelfth Night itself, that actually addressed this common trope, uh, typically there was always a return to normalcy. The transgressive aspect of it was li widely limited. Um, Twelfth Night in particular, according to Gene Howard, uh, states that there was never any doubt in the audience's mind of the heterosexual sexual orientation or Viola's properly feminine subjectivity, uh, which is partially why um, we had Viola played by me as a trans person um, as such acts in subversion of the strictly normative reading. Uh, indeed, such a return would be seen as even more subversive to a society at large, especially during Renaissance, the Renaissance period. Moving on to the next slide. So although these so although these theories of gender were warring and the general cultural consensus placed men ubiquitously above women, uh, this same thought fed into the prevailing humanist opinion that male friendships should be the most important in a man's life, uh, at the very least on par with any romantic relationships or any familial bonds. And you can see that illustrated in this image to the left here in its inscription, mm -hmm. where friendship and true love are placed on the same plane. Now, this special friendship and the Elizabethan interpretations of what that closeness should be really informed our staging decisions about the dynamic between Orsino and Cesario. 
Admittedly, when reading or seeing these relationships in a modern context, it can be tough not to read into the subtext and the emotional intimacy uh, infused into them and assume a romantic attraction between the two. And we did want to show and hone some of that in the ambiguity of the intensity of their relationship on stage, Cesario and uh, Orsino, I mean. Now, scholars generally agree, however, that homosexuality as a single, singular sexual orientation uh, was non-existent in Shakespearean society. In reality, what we see as homoerotic behavior, uh, like kissing and hugging, were common in Elizabethan friendships and in the 17th century image on the right, as the 17th century image on the right shows. Uh, but the relationship had to have a certain balance of public exposure, uh, as a friendship of this caliber that was seen as too private could be as tacked as something transgressively wrong. Now, as you'll see, have seen in our scene, Orsino has distinctly made Cesario his 